Order it, it being 3 p.m. in accordance with Standing Order 106A, the time for member statements is concluded. Thanks, the Honourable Lord. Acting Prime Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I inform the House that the Prime Minister, the Honourable Paul Keating, will be absent from question time today. Mr. Keating is in Japan on government business. I will answer questions today on his behalf. I also inform the House that Mr. Tickner is uh, absent also, and in his absence, questions will be answered by the Minister for Social Security, Mr. Baldwin. Quest questions without notice. The Honourable Member for Flinders. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is to the Acting uh, Prime Minister. If individual staff salary packages include different rewards, such as bonuses for greater individual efforts, how can such agreements violate the principle of equal? work for equal pay of equal value, how can the government claim that those on salary packages with different performance criteria and more flexible working arrangements should be treated the same as those on the award? Why is the government opposed to better pay for better work? The Honourable Lackey, Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, the government has always accepted that there will be, has always accepted that we'll be in certain arrangements from time to time pay differentials. So go to uh, in, in general terms, the skill with which uh, uh, the workers apply their work. What we've never accepted, what we've never accepted, is the notion that there ought to be equal pay for equal work, and that people standing alongside each other, doing the same job, essentially receive very substantial pay differentials. It has, of course, always been the position of the opposition that they should. Indeed, when questioned on this matter uh, some time ago uh, by a journalist, the journalist's question was this to Mr. the leader of the opposition. So, Mr Howard, you would have a picture where on a production line or behind a counter you'd have two workers, one with award conditions and another with a contract, and there would be great variations. Mr Howard, that's right. Great, and journalist, again, to make sure he absolutely got it right. Great variations in pay and conditions, Mr Howard. That is absolutely right, just in, the, in case the point wasn't taken. And the point that the government uh, believes and uh, has expressed the view over the last few days in relation to the industrial dispute now before the IRC, is that where work is being performed, the same tasks are being performed, there ought to be an equality of pay between the people performing those tasks. That is not your position. And, uh, it is ne oh, yeah, you, li you like to try and think that's your position now as you shift and change with the wind, but the fact of the matter is you've made your position quite clear, and the whole, and the whole substance of the way in which you have intervened yourselves with your public comments in this dispute is that basically what you want to do is you want to see workers stripped of their right to collective bargaining and you want to see them discouraged from, uh, uh, from uh, taking up that right by being massively and severely discriminated against in the uh, massively and severely discriminated against in, the, in their employment. And indeed the notion, Order. the notion Order. that you would have people uh, essentially working alongside each other doing the same tasks, having applied to them some sort of, uh, uh, of, uh, of little differential in some arrangement related to a contract as opposed to the award, producing a seven to twenty thousand dollar difference in annual income is a joke. Order, before I call the honourable member for Perth, I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon members of a parliamentary delegation from the Philippines. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to our visitors. Yes. Honourable member for Perth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade. And the minister advised what the APEC, me the APEC meetings in Osaka achieved and what, benef what benefits can Australia expect to gain from APEC trade liberalisation. The Honourable the Minister for Development, Cooperation and Pacific Island Affairs, representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you uh, very much, Mr Speaker. Well, Australia can be very proud and pleased with the result that was obtained in Osaka. With the agreement on the action agenda, which was put forward by APEC foreign and trade ministers, uh, and notably uh, in the work in that, that was done by Senators McMullen and Evans in that regard deserves commendation, agreed to by leaders, sets out a unique trade policy framework which gives real substance to the Bogor vision of free and open trade and investment in our region by 2010 for developing countries, by 2020 for developing economies. Now that's a unique framework because it doesn't rely on the traditional GATT style give and take negotiation. The final goals have been set. It's now up to individual members to prepare their own plans. Order. The first stage Order. of which 
The first stage of those plans will be reached by the end of next year when members submit their action plans. The process won't be purely unilateral either. The action agenda includes agreement on a range of general principles that will guide APEC liberalisation, plus a process of consultation and review. It includes, very importantly, Mr. Speaker, the principle of comprehensive coverage. And that means uh, for Australia that agriculture will be part of the process, and that's an issue which is of key importance, uh, including uh, to those opposite. The notion of flexibility is also written into the action agenda, but it's going to be exercised within the timeframes of the Bogor de Declaration. We're very pleased, Mr. Mr Speaker, with the wording on comparability, uh, giving members confidence that their own liberalisation plans under APEC will be matched by the efforts of others. In other words, this is going to be a level playing field uh, that we're achieving. Uh, the critical commitment in Bogor uh, to the end dates of 2010-2020 for achieving free and open trade have been reaffirmed. Now, while uh, those trade liberalisation objectives have grabbed the headlines, there are other very distinct and important aspects of the action agenda, uh, trade facilitation and economic cooperation, that will have a very considerable impact on the region's development. With its breadth and depth, the action agenda is a testament to the growing economic integration of the region, and it will be seen as a major advance in its economic development. We've done some modelling, Mr Speaker which suggests that APEC trade liberalisation and facilitation will provide a very significant boost to economic growth in the region and, importantly, in Australia itself. In the Australian economy, real income is expected to increase by 6.8 per cent or $40 billion as a result of free trade when all the effects flow through. Uh, and of that total, trade liberalisation will deliver 4.3 per cent or $25 billion Australian dollars increase in real income, while trade facilitation will deliver a further $2.5 or $15, million, $15 billion. Uh, that, will mean, uh, an economic, that economic growth will mean uh, jobs, uh, employment growth of the order of 500,000 new jobs over the course of the liberalisation period. Uh, tangible benefits uh, in the near term through trade facilitation will include simplification and harmonisation of customs procedures and by speeding up trade flows and building private sector confidence through greater transparency across the region. Facilitation through competition policy, rules of origin, uh, dispute mediation, deregulation and mobility of business people. Uh, finally, Mr Speaker, for the region as a whole, Bogor's liberalisation and facilitation agenda is expected to increase income by around uh, $993 billion, 3.8 per cent, when all the, the combined effects throw through. And that represents more than the combined current size of the Australian and South Korean economies, more than 10 times the size of the Malaysian economy, more than one and a half times the current size of the Chinese economy. And those benefits will accrue to all APEC economies, with developing APEC economies mo benefiting the most. Uh, Mr Speaker, might I conclude by saying uh, that uh, the Japanese government is to be congratulated uh, on the results of Osaka and uh, the work which Australia has put into that, uh, including the Prime Minister and uh, Senators Evans and McMullen, was crucial to that. Uh, the Prime Minister will be making a statement, a full statement, on Osaka when he returns. The Honourable Member for Flinders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice again is to the Acting Prime Minister. Is it a fact that employers may enter into staff salary packages with employees where over-award remuneration is linked to individual performance? If so, will you now publicly acknowledge that the packages CRA has with the majority of their employees are authorised and supported by your policy? The Honourable Acting Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, well before the, uh, any changes we made to the industrial relations system and what has always been a part of the industrial relations system since time immemorial is the capacity from time to time for employers to enter into uh, individual contracts. There's no question about that. It's always been there. It's been there before, before we, uh, we changed the in industrial laws. It's been a constant feature of our industrial system since time immemorial. What, is, what, we, regard, what we regard as entirely inappropriate is a set of workers doing the same, amount, the same type of work 
uh, alongside people performing those tasks should receive, a, firstly, a set Order. of conditions which means that there is a pay differential between them of something like $70,000 to $20,000, and that's admitted. And secondly, what we've always believed, and we believe that the Industrial Relations Act, up, Act upholds, is that there ought to be a capacity for workers, if they so choose, to collectively bargain and have that recognised and, uh, and have that engaged by any of the companies concerned. And that has not occurred until the intervention of the Prime Minister, as far as these workers are concerned. It has not occurred in this instance until, until that point of time. Order. Those on my left. Until that point of time. Those on so, my left. And the, and the third thing that we have always, uh, always supported very strongly is the capacity of workers to be to be to be to be represented uh, by trade unions. And the simple fact of the matter is that whatever way you intend to dress it up or try to dress it up, what you have being applied here, uh, within the constraints of, uh, the, uh, of the existing operation, is an effort by CRA to try and drive the unions out of their workforce and to do it via establishing Member discriminatory arrangements between the two sets of workers. And precisely that issue is being tested at the moment uh, before, the, uh, before the IRC. Uh, and again, it has been tested before the IRC because of the initiatives of the, uh, of the Minister for Industrial Relations. And you always let the cat out of the bags with yourselves by whom you support. You're trying to say that we've actually changed on our positions, where we said that we could see the two working alongside each other, doing the same tasks, effectively being discriminated against, which you now try to deny and obfuscate, though you've made those statements repeatedly. And where you have, it's like those statements that you say that your position is that, uh, that people should not in contract arrangements suffer a diminution of wages. And you say, oh, no, no, we've never said that or implied that. You've said it repeatedly, of course, and you say it in private all over the place, as the press gallery knows. Whether you say it now openly and publicly is another matter. But that, of course, is what your intentions are. You reveal your intentions by your attitude on this particular dispute. It's not there to support the capacity of the workers to collectively bargain. It's not there to support an equality of outcomes when same work is being done by people essentially doing, pursuing uh, the same activity at the same level of responsibility. It's not to go into bat on that. It is to go into bat to defend whatever discriminatory practice is in place at the moment and to emphasise the capacity to get workers into individual contracts. You tip your hand every time. You tip your hand and reveal that, of course, what is the occasional medicine of an industrial relations system that's relatively open, as our industrial relations system is, is, is your daily breakfast if the legislation that you'd ever want to put in place were ever, were ever capable of, uh, of being implemented uh, if you ever managed to get yourselves into government. And there's another ingredient in all of this which is absolutely critical and, of course, a major differential between the point where, uh, where this situation is now and where you would be. We believe in a strong industrial relations commission with a capacity to intervene in the national interests and, if necessary, uh, make awards, either minimum rates awards or paid rates awards. That is our position. It is not yours. Your position is to gut the IRC. You would be left in a situation in which, uh, if you were confronted by a, uh, uh, with, with this, particular, uh, this particular problem when you were in office, you would be elect, left without a capacity to bring in an independent arbitrator to act in the natural, national interest, to bring these matters to a conclusion, as is being done at the moment, you'd be left flummoxing around giving your opinions on this and that activity about the company and how sinful the unions were and nothing else. The Honourable Member for Lowe. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Social Security. Can the Minister advise the House of the effects of the government's family policies on the welfare of Australian children? The Honourable Minister for Social Security. To, uh, speaker, I, I thank the honourable member for her question. I know that she has a very keen interest in this uh, area of policy. And uh, as I've uh, pointed out to the House on a number of occasions before, Mr. Speaker, a great deal has been achieved by this government in assistance to families, particularly assistance targeted at low-income families, including the low-income working families. And just to remind the House of uh, some of the key statistics again. The real value of additional family payment up 76 per cent for children under 13 and up by 147 per cent for children between the ages of 13 and 15. The breadth of coverage of additional family payment for low-income working households has in increased enormously. It's been an 11-fold increase to around about 300,000 
uh, working families now receiving AFP. Maximum level of rent assistance, again, Mr. Speaker, increased by, by between 80 and 140 per cent in real terms and extended to low income working families. And uh, there's a further $5 increase per fortnight due to come in in March. And we're, then we've also seen the introduction of the parenting allowance. Uh, the additional parenting allowance targeted again at low income families where one person is staying at home looking after the children, and again, substantial real increases associated with that. So the picture is very clear, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the real value of that assistance to families has been improved very considerably under this government. But uh, a second thrust, apart from increasing the value of this assistance, has been to try and ensure that the assistance gets into the hands of the primary carer, that is to say the person who has the day-to-day -day responsibility for looking after the children. And that's led to a number of structural changes in payments over the years, the most recent example being the introduction replacement of the dependent spouse rebate with Hacker and then the parenting allowance for, for families uh, with children. And that has brought about a, a, a redistribution of income within the family. But uh, a, a previous uh, instance of where this government went down that route, Mr Speaker, was in early 1993 with the so-called families integration, where we uh, split the payments so that the family payments and the rent assistance components were explicitly directed to the primary carer. Now, what was the effect of that? That wasn't a measure that increased uh, total outlays, but what it did do was bring about this redistribution within the family. And there's some very interesting uh, research work and evaluation just being completed uh, by my department, Mr. Speaker, on the impact of that. And what it shows is that in around about 29 per cent of the families uh, concerned, just as a result of that redistribution, not as a result of any increase, but just as a result of that redistribution to the primary carer, in 29 per cent of families there's been a significant increase in, in the amount actually spent on the children, Mr Speaker. So that's a, a very significant result which I think shows the wisdom and uh, uh, efficacy of our policy of getting assistance into the hands of the primary carer. And Mr Speaker, this is, of course, is another area of policy where we hear a lot of rhetoric from the opposition. We've seen nothing specific. We've seen references to income splitting and different variants of income splitting and so-called family taxation, all of which are highly regressive in their impact, all of which serve to increase workforce disincentives for women, and all of which are thoroughly regressive in, in, in social policy terms. Mr Speaker, I, I think uh, if, you, if you look at this government's record in family assistance and the further measures we've announced in the budget, it is a pretty solid and creditable one which contrasts with the policy vacuum on, on the opposition side. Honourable Member for Gippsland. Uh, my question without notice is to the Minister for Resources. I draw the Minister's attention to the widespread use of staff salary arrangements in the resources industry, including the large workforces at Mount Tom Price, Robe River and the North West Shelf. In light of the strike at Weeper, do you now condemn these salary arrangements, or do you recognise their importance in improving labour relations and the international competitiveness of Australia's resource industries? Honourable Minister for Resources. I thank the member for his question. And, uh, one thing that will always separate this side of the House from that side of the House is you believe that you should have a fair day's pay for a fair day's work and the right of equal work for equal pay. I visited a large range of projects where there is total uh, non-union workforce, such as, say, uh, Hammersley Iron in, the, in, the, in North and Western Australia, by agreement. What we have in the situation in Weeper is a situation where the whole workforce does not want to go to that condition. Therefore, they should be able to get equal pay for equal work. The particular, uh, and order, order. that's what the dispute about is in, in CRA. It is what the dispute about is in Weeper. The honourable member knows that. It is an inducement a financial inducement to break down the workforce. The government member interjects about the coal strike, and I'll take that interjection up because we've spent a lot of time this year trying to reform the Australian coal industry and to try and make sure. Now, look, when industrial relations are raised with me by customers, it's me that raises the industrial relations because we've had a remarkable good record in recent times. The fact is that CRA, which operates a number of coal mines, CRA operates a number of coal miners, already tried to get some of those coal miners onto contracts. There is great reluctance in the United Mine Workers Union, which is a section of the CFMEU, because that industry is an extraordinarily dangerous industry. There is a, you know, and the honourable member for Gibsons knows because we visited together, went to the Mara Memorial, which was a very moving occasion, and saw the difficulties and the dangers associated with the coal industry. There is an enormous amount of mateship in the industry. It's about teamwork. What they see is they think that the union has a capacity to represent those workers and they don't believe in individual contracts. What we're saying is 
That matter should be resolved between the union and management. We think that today there should not be a national coal strike. The ACTU recommended that that not take place. I think that that recommendation should have followed, be followed by the CFMEU, and we hopefully that matter will be resolved today. The Honourable Member for Macquarie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing and Regional Development. I refer to the accord signed with local government last week. Can the Minister tell the House what is the significance of the signing of that accord? The Honourable the Minister for Housing and Regional Development. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, the Honourable Member for Macquarie uh, for, her, uh, for her question. Uh, she referred to uh, a meeting uh, or assembly last week of local governments, uh, which uh, was held for the second uh, year. It included uh, something like 800 delegates uh, representing uh, most, if not all, local government units uh, in Australia. So it was a very, very significant uh, meeting. It was significant uh, uh, in part for the accord, uh, Mr. Speaker, that was. Uh, signed uh, at that meeting, and secondly, it was significant because of the inability, uh, both on the part of the shadow spokesperson and the Leader of the Opposition, to say a single word of policy substance at this uh, very, very important and very representative meeting. Mr Speaker, last Wednesday the Prime Minister uh, signed off this historic agreement, which recognises a partnership between the Commonwealth and local government in an agreed reform agenda. Together we are tackling the major reform issues enterprise bargaining, reform of business regulations, fast track planning and building approvals, road construction and maintenance, access to emerging information technology, and social justice for Indigenous Australians. Mr Speaker, each of these issues is a first order issue very important in terms of efficiency and fairness at the local or community scale. Underpinning this, this uh, relationship is a commitment by this government to constitutional recognition of local government, a sound financial relationship which is subject to regular review and a recently announced local government development uh, program of $48 million over the next four years, which will provide a stable funding stream for local government initiative. Against this backdrop picture, if you will, Mr. Speaker, let me uh, paint the response of the opposition. 800 delegates uh, at the convention, eager to hear the opposition's policy on local government. The last chance for the opposition, effectively, to air its policy to a, such a large and representative gathering of local government before the next election. Order. Order the House. Well, what order. does uh, what does the uh, shadow uh, spokesperson, my colleague uh, Mr. Prescott, uh, have to say? He said he wouldn't be releasing his policy because, quote, it's like good wine; it was still maturing. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, let me say that this old bottle, under the under the under the stairs, still has the cork in. Still has the cork in. The opposition, right having absolutely helping. no policy ideas, fails at this conference to spell out any directions whatever. All we have from the Leader of the Opposition is vague philosophical, philosophical meandering in which he repeats the fact that there are three tiers of government, very clever, three tiers of government, that uh, ultimately if you're going to have uh, constitutional recognition of local government, then you've got to get the permission of the states. You've got to get effectively the permission of the states. So effectively any sense that local government has any integrity, any autonomy, any status, any stature, any reason at all why this, why this opposition should make any policy announcement, uh, then that, that simply doesn't exist. So we send uh, Bruce Scott along. He's got nothing to say except a bit about old wine. And the Leader of the Opposition makes uh, a speech uh, at which uh, delegates Order, gave up their lunch, left. a speech at that conference in which he failed to say a single word of substance uh, in the course of that speech. Mr Speaker, whatever you say about local government, they're not fools, they're not going to be trivialised and they're not going to forget the fact that uh, the Leader of the Opposition had absolutely nothing to say. Mr Speaker, he's a joke. 
The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Um, Mr. Um, um, Mr. Uh, Speaker, my question, my question is addressed to the to the acting Prime Minister. Isn't it a fact? Um, isn't it a fact, acting Prime Minister, that in um, um, 1989, the man who's just been recycled to uh, rescue the Prime Minister from his embarrassment? Um, isn't it? Isn't it a fact? Isn't Order. it a fact? I ask. Order, those are my rights. Isn't those it, are my rights. Isn't it a fact? I a member for Patterson, no, in particular. <laughs> isn't it a fact, Mr. Uh, Speaker, that in uh, that in that in I asked the Deputy Prime Minister, isn't it a fact that in 1989, the then government marshalled um, all of the resources of the Commonwealth, the Royal Australian Air Force, the ACTU and a whole lot of other instruments of the Commonwealth to deny a trade union the rights of collective bargaining, namely the Australian Pilots' Federation. And, and didn't, they in fact, didn't they in fact marshal all of those resources to drive every last one of those pilots into an individual contract and exert all of their power before the Conciliation and Arbitration Commission to deny them the right of collective bargaining? I asked the Acting Prime Minister what has happened between now and then to convert the pro-contract passion of 1989 to the anti-contract passion of 1995? Yeah. Yeah. Honourable Acting Prime Minister. And what, what has happened since then for you to, uh, for you to decide that uh, somehow or other you don't stand by your position in which you said, so Mr Howard, you could have a picture where on a production line or behind a counter where you'd have two workers, one with award conditions and another one with a contract, and there would be great variation. How that's right. Journalists, great variations in pay and conditions. How that is absolutely right. What happened in 1989 was we then had a very much more centralised wage fixing set of arrangements, <laughs> which we did have at that point of time. Order. A very much Order. more centralised wage fixing sort of arrangements, which had delivered these things. That had delivered no, these no, things. No, no. And it, it, had, it had delivered. It had, de it, it had, de it had uh, delivered de record growth rates in this country, twice the growth rates you had. It had delivered on Order, top of that. Those are my it had delivered on top of that a rate of job increase twice that that applied when uh, when you were in office. Member it had Flinders. also produced in this country. It had also produced in this country a level of uh, industrial peace that this country had not enjoyed under yourselves, reducing the level of industrial disputation to where it remains today at approximately about 10 to 15 per cent of what it was in the period of time that, uh, that you actually happened to be in office. And the, set of, uh, the set of arrangements that were put in place then dealt with the, uh, the capacity to sustain that system. And the set of arrangements that apply now deal with the capacity to sustain the contemporary system in a way that allows some flexibi considerable flexibility but also with equal justice. And it ill behoves a company or anyone else in this system to get into a situation where you move beyond the capacity to deliver on a, uh, uh, on, uh, on a collective bargain, you move beyond that capacity and move beyond the capacity of a, of a group of individuals to be represented by a union if they so, so choose, by putting in place in front of them practical impediments to the achievement of that and then active discrimination when they assume it. And that is what the issues are that are entailed here. And uh, it is it is a dispute which, uh, in terms of the record of this country's industrial relations system since you left office, is an aberration. But what is an aberration in this system would be under yourself, as you freely acknowledge in private and admit, and as those who are your economic analysts uh, say would be a, a definite feature were you to be in government of the, of the first 18 months period of your opposition, what would be an aberration would be, as I said before, daily fare. The Honourable Member for Morton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Security. Is the Minister aware of reports about the role of pensioners in reducing national debt? Are pensioners responsible for Australia's national debt? The Honourable Minister for Social Security. Mr. Speaker, uh, honourable members would be uh, would recall that uh, a few weeks ago, the Leader of the Opposition made a speech to ACOS on social policy. The, uh, which he, uh, this, was, this was to be uh, one of the uh, much touted, uh, much vaunted uh, headland speeches, or wasteland speeches, as I prefer to call them, which he um, was going to outline his directions in various areas. 
and the honourable members would uh, recall that the speech consisted, insofar as there was any substance at all, it consisted of a series of negatives, a listing of things that he claimed that he would not do, and uh, among things, a rather carefully formulated listing of things he would not do, by the way, and that included he would not slash $10 billion off the social wage, for example. He left open the possibility that, we, that he would slash some figure less than $10 billion off the social wage, but he wouldn't slash $10 billion off the social wage. So we have a, this, uh, this policy vacuum which continues from the opposition. Uh, we, we can make judgments about what they would do from their record, from the fact that uh, pensions, allowances, payments to low-income people all fell or slipped behind indexation during his period of tenure as Treasurer and during the period of the previous government. So we do know some things. But the other source of uh, information about what the opposition might do and what their actual underlying attitudes to social policy questions are come from utterances from some members of their back benches and statements, in fact, from some of their front benches in their more unguarded moments. Uh, honourable members will recall the statement by the leader of the National Party uh, extolling the virtues of the tie system. Uh, where, uh, where the families are, are expected to look after old age uh, people rather than having a public pension scheme. But the most recent example of this, Mr Speaker, was a, a statement by the uh, opponent, the, the honourable member for Lilly's uh, Liberal opponent, and in, uh, in a letter to uh, the, a local paper, uh, she said, and I quote, a major element in consumer spending is purchasing by people who receive their income from government in salaries, pensions, doles and allowances. So put it all together and we find that Mr Keating's economic growth signifies ever-increasing indebtedness." End quote. Now, what are we intended to infer from that, Mr Speaker? I mean, what, that, what, what, what is being implied here is that the people on low incomes, people who rely on these benefits, including pensioners, are in some sense responsible for the country's national debt. Now, what, uh, that's, uh, that's the sort of attitude that comes out time and again from the, lead, from the, from the opposition. The reality is, Mr Speaker, that under this government we have established a social safety net which, uh, according to a recent study by uh, a group of academics at the ANU, is one of the most efficient in the world in two respects. Firstly, it is the most efficient of a group of ten OECD countries that were studied in terms of getting the assistance to those who need it and not making payments to those who don't need it. In other words, in terms of targeting efficiency, it was easily the most efficient social safety net of the group of ten countries studied. Secondly, in terms of administrative efficiency, Mr Speaker, it was the second most efficient of the, of the group of ten OECD countries studied in terms of administrative expenditures as a proportion of program outlays. So the only other country of the group that had a better ratio in that respect was Norway. So in those two key respects, we have a, a, a very efficient social safety net in this country that, notwithstanding the fact that we pay out less than many other countries on, on, these, on these payments. We have a system which is comparably effective at preventing poverty simply because of its greater efficiency, Mr Speaker. And yet we get this, this sort of nonsense from the, the member for Lilly's opponent somehow suggesting that people, pensioners and others who, who depend on these payments are, are to be held responsible for our national debt. I mean, it's outrageous and scandalous and it really does reveal the true uh, set of attitudes that underlie uh, the thinking on, of, coalition, of the coalition on these issues. The Honourable Member for Chisholm. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Minister for Human Services and Health. Now that the Marks Royal Commission has found that you have been untruthful about your knowledge and involvement in the Eastern Affair, is it your position that lying when holding high public office does not matter? Or do you assert that those who gave contradictory evidence to Order, you in the those Royal on my Commission, right. including your former Cabinet colleagues Ian Taylor, Jim McGinty, Eric Ripper, Jeff Gallup, Keith Wilson, Pam Beggs, Judith Watson, and John Kabelke are liars, and that your former staff members, Zoltan Kovacs, Bob Willoughby and Marcel Anderson, are also liars. Honourable Minister for Human Services and Health, order those on my right. Mr. Mr Speaker, I've made it clear right from the outset when it was first mooted that there might be an inquiry of this kind, and others too who've looked at it, that it was clearly a political exercise designed, designed order, by... Order. Designed. Order. Those on my left and right. Uh, the, minister, the minister will wait for a moment. It's not as if it was unexpected the minister would be given a question at least on this today. She will be given the opportunity to be heard in silence. Just relax. Mr. Speaker, it's just started, and I'll adjudicate, not you. A political exercise, as I say, designed by the Liberal Party at both state and federal levels, despite denials, despite denials from the leader of the opposition. 
And, Mr. Speaker, it's been recognised as a political exercise by a great many people, including, for example, the Anglican Archbishop of Perth, who called it politically contrived, and the Uniting Church Order. moderator, Mr. Speaker, who described it as a political assassination tool. These are people independent of politics, Mr. Speaker, who see it clearly for what it is. Order. It was conceived in malice. It was established for improper purposes. Member it is Pro itself. Order. The Royal Commission is, and indeed was itself, an abuse of executive power. <laughs> to accept its findings, Mr. Speaker, or to, tact, to take any action in relation to them, would be to condone that abuse of executive power. And, Mr. Speaker, that's something that I've indicated, and the Prime Minister has also indicated that we don't intend to do. Mr. Speaker, its conduct was, and its conclusions are, gravely flawed. Mr. Speaker, the Commissioner himself indicated that its terms of reference were restricted and indeed unclear. At one stage, Mr. Speaker, the Commissioner himself indicated that if speaking to my counsel, order, if you don't order. know what it's about, you'll have to work it out for yourself. So the Commissioner himself wasn't prepared to say clearly what the report was all about. Mr. Speaker, it's very clear, it's very clear that the report lacked procedural Member fairness. The report was highly tendentious and virtually devoid of any rigorous analysis of evidence. Mr Speaker, the Commissioner himself said during hearings that he was not accustomed to making decisions on half the evidence, and yet he has clearly done precisely that in his findings. To accept such findings, Mr Speaker, in any Order. form would further lower the standards of Royal Commissions, which have reached new lows with this Royal Commission. The Commissioner himself said the findings would be open to doubt, and they certainly are, Mr Speaker. And I think it's worth saying and reminding Order. members here that royal commissions are not judicial, they are not independent of government, they are tools Member of the executive Gipsland. without the constraints and safeguards that normally apply in judicial proceedings. And I think it's also worth uh, repeating, Mr Speaker, that for the two days before the Commission began its hearings, <coughs> as I understand it, the, commissioner, uh, the uh, council assisting and others were briefed for two days by court's dirt team, by his political operatives, the people who have been shown, shown, to be active, shown to be active for nearly three years, solely Order. concerned, solely Order. concerned Mr. Speaker, with seeking Member to discredit solely concerned, Mr. Speaker, with seeking to discredit the former government. Mr Speaker, I think it also needs to be repeated that Royal Commissions are normally reserved for matters of extreme gravity, usually illegality. And in this case, Mr Speaker, that has not been the case. It's very important from my point of view, Mr Speaker, to recognise here that you have two people, Marks and Vanstone, who would purport to act as prosecutor, judge and jury without the normal safeguards that apply in these cases. Order. Order. By, exposing, by exposing that cabinet that I was part of and indeed by precedent all others to succeeding governments going back and investigating what they may, not, may or may not have said in Cabinet, and by exposing parliamentarians to intimidation by the executive, they have opened a Pandora's box, Mr Speaker, and I, for one, am not going to stand by and allow that precedent to become part of political action in Australia. The Honourable Member for McEwen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Justice. Would the Minister inform the House what the government is doing to prevent money laundering? particularly organised crime laundering their profits through financial institutions. The Honourable Minister for Justice. Liberals Liberals. Well, thank you. Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. Of course, uh, money laundering is a component now of uh, international organised crime, and it's part of a sophisticated act. Mr Speaker, it might help if uh, the opposition at least uh, had, had some kind of interest in the proceedings of the House. It might help the House if the Minister gets to his answer. Now, one of the important things about uh, international globalisation of crime is that it does bring to, a, bring to account those who wish to hide the proceeds of crime and wish to avoid tax. And uh, organised crime and money laundering do go hand in hand. This government's uh, response to the threat posed by money laundering included the creation in 1989 of Austrac, 
uh, the Australian Transaction Reports and Analysis Centre. Now, that monitors some 20,000 transactions every day and has some 12 million transactions on its uh, database. It has 80 staff, and under the direction of uh, Bill Code, Director Bill Code, its job is to analyse fin financial transaction data and to identify criminal activity, including money laundering and white-collar crime and drug trafficking. Now, one of the key techniques that is used is the scheme by which uh, uh, banks and other institutions are required to support, uh, report suspicious transactions to Austrac. Uh, one recent example is a person sending funds overseas through numerous bank branches in a suspicious uh, fashion. Police checks revealed the use of false names, addresses, and subsequently a police operation uh, resulted in charges and the seizure of a large quantity of heroin. Now, there have been many other uh, notable success stories. Included in those are 26 people being charged with more than 550 offences arising from a conspiracy to defraud the states and the Commonwealth by evading the payment of uh, tobacco licensing fees. Over $30 million in uh, tax assessments have been issued. A suspect transaction report provided key information uh, concerning fraud in negotiable instruments and conviction of the offender, and a long custodial sentence followed. And a suspect transaction report uh, from a financial institution identifying a false name account led to the arrest of a person operating as an unregistered tax agent, forging signatures and falsifying claims, and that person was jailed for several years. Now, one of the things that uh, Austrac has picked up on in recent times is the growing evidence that some solicitors are uh, laundering money uh, by uh, placing cash Order. in trust accounts to Those hide on, ownership of that those money. On my left, just keep uh, it for down. example, uh, following identification of a series of unusual transactions, an investigation discovered. Uh, uh, nearly three quarters of a million dollars have been channelled through a solicitor's trust account, and charges have been laid in that matter. What we've done as a government is respond to that threat by requiring that solicitors ought to uh, report cash transactions of over $10,000, thereby bringing solicitors into line with other professionals. There will, of course, be no obligation to report uh, merely suspicious transactions because of the reason of uh, uh, the, the solicitor's. Uh, uh, obligations to their client uh, in that regard, if, uh, but the actual uh, operation of any uh, cash transaction over $10,000 must now will now need to be reported following the legislative response the government proposes. We're not merely seen as successful in Australia. Internationally, uh, the government uh, has been successful in having a high profile. Australia leads a, has a leading role internationally in, in the fight against money laundering. The G7 nations set up the Financial Action Task Force uh, in 1989 to fight international money laundering. Uh, the task force was chaired by the current National Crime Authority head, uh, Tom Sherman, in 1992-3. And Australia funds the Task Force Asia Secretariat uh, from our Confiscated Assets Trust Fund. Uh, Bill Code, who is head of uh, Austrac, recently was invited uh, by the United States Office of National Drug Control Policy to speak at a financial on financial crime at a key international crime conference. And that invitation, too, is an international recognition of this success, particularly Austrac's uh, innovative use of technology to effectively analyse the huge volumes of material and financial information that it, uh, it possesses. Uh, I understand that later today uh, there will be a tabling of Austrac's uh, annual report, and I would commend its contents uh, to those members of the House uh, particularly the honourable member who asked the question, who has an ongoing interest in this area, uh, for what I think is one of Australia's great successes in this area. The honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Human Services and Health. I remind her that she was found to have lied about the Eastern Petition on the evidence of her former Labor Cabinet colleagues Jim McGuinty, Eric Ripper, Jeff Gallup, Keith Wilson, Pam Beggs, Judith Watson, John Kabelke, and on the evidence of Labor staffers Zoltan Kovacs and Bob Willoughby. Since you have been found to have lied by the Royal Commission, why should the public ever trust your word again? And as the Prime Minister considers lying no disqualification for office in his government, what reason is there to think that any other minister in the government is more honest than you are? Honourable Minister for Human Services and Speaker. As I said earlier, and I, I will repeat it because I think it needs to be, this was a commission, Order. This Order. Was a commission constituted for a clearly political purpose, 
and the conclusions reached in the Commission's report and the way it was conducted bear witness to that. They have exactly the same character as the original intention. Mr. Speaker. Some people have tried to suggest that because it was a royal commission, it somehow enjoys special status. It does not, Mr. Speaker. It Order. depends entirely on how these matters are conducted. The Commissioner himself said the, the terms of reference were selective. No attempt made to examine the role of Liberal Party members in presenting matters to the Parliament. No attempt, and indeed an explicit refusal, to deal with certain the inconsistencies in the current Premier's evidence. All of those matters were set aside, and the Commissioner himself, at an early stage, at least appeared to recognise that that was problematic. Let me tell him it is, Mr Speaker, because while it might be a Royal Commission in the sense that it was constituted as a so-called properly Member constituted inquiry, it shares some of the same characteristics with many others. I think Senator Ray in the other place indicated earlier that when you have an inquiry that has this characteristic, you do not accept its conclusions any more than you would say with the Spanish Inquisition or the, the McCarthyist purges, or the McCarthyist purges, Mr Speaker. This Mr. Speaker, one Order. of the things that I want to make Order. very clear in all of this is that I am just as entitled, as is anyone in this House, to judge the Commission and its findings in the same way as they saw fit to judge me. And, Mr. Speaker, I find, Order. Order. I find Mr. Speaker, having looked at things like the fact that there was no analysis or argument in the Royal Commission report, findings are simply boldly asserted without reference to the evidence. And a lot of evidence is simply ignored if it's inconvenient. It doesn't fit the line that they picked up in the first two days, the line of the court government, the government of hate, as it's described by now, by political commentators. No analysis or argument. The contradictions in evidence are unreconciled. The only interpretation that's ever offered, if people agree with me, is that they have some motive for doing so, or that they're in some way not to be trusted, or that they're simply ignored, Mr Speaker. It's an extraordinary effort. Some evidence is simply set aside altogether from people equally, um, uh, yes, equally competent to say what occurred at the time, Mr. Speaker. If it fits, if it fits into the preconceptions, if it fits into the preconceptions that clearly existed at the time, then the evidence is accepted, if not set aside. And there's a clear reliance on hearsay right throughout the report, Mr. Speaker. So I find that it's a seriously flawed document. I find that it is. And I'm not the only one to do so, Mr. Speaker. I would hope, I would Order. hope that members opposite, I would hope Order. that members opposite, understand that the people, the people in the Australian left. community, the people in the Australian community understand what this exercise is all about, about and they are increasingly, they are increasingly, Mr. Speaker expressing that view whenever they are asked. And I would simply say to the member opposite, if you actually this was taken after the Royal Commission. That's just for your vision. No, That's no, just for no. your vision. There you go. But they the don't minister, believe you. The minister they will don't resume her seat. Those on my left will put those away. I have said to the minister she will order. I said to the minister she will resume her seat. Those on my left also know better. The member for Stirling, who distributed those before the uh, question time started today, I think also knows better and should. The honourable member for Port Adelaide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Development, Cooperation and Pacific Island Affairs. Is the minister aware of reports of a proposal to cancel construction of the Mi Tuan Bridge across the Mekong? Is it the intention of the government to proceed with that bridge? What would be the effect on the relationship between Vietnam and Australia if the bridge contract were to be cancelled? And what are the implications for Australian exports and jobs? The Honourable the Minister for Development, Cooperation and Pacific Island Affairs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, uh, the Coalition's Foreign Affairs spokesman, I don't think he actually said that the coalition, if in the unfortunate event that it came to government, would cancel construction of the Meetwan Bridge. But what he did say is that the is that the contract would be the project would be quote reviewed. But given that he's described this project as inappropriate, extravagant, and a cynically timed exercise, I really wouldn't I really wouldn't fancy the chances of it seeing the light of day if the if the member for Mayo ever had a say in this matter. When the Prime Minister and I announced the project on the 15th of November that the Government of Australia and of Vietnam 
had decided to proceed with construction of the Meituan Bridge, which is the largest infrastructure project ever financed under the Australian Aid Program. Uh, then the Shadow Minister fired off one of his usual get your mouth in gear but don't worry about the mind responses. And he was, he was at his, his absolutely ill informed and patronising best when he said, and I quote, the decision to build a second bridge across the Mekong is an inappropriate use of Australian aid money and a cynically timed exercise designed to lock up the aid budget long after Labor is gone. Unquote. Well, where has he been? And just how much attention has he been paying to the, to the Australian aid program? Does he know, for example, that Australia's assistance in building this bridge was requested by the government of Vietnam as its highest infrastructure priority? Uh, and why is that such a high priority? Well, because of the huge benefits it's going to bring by joining the Mekong Delta. At the moment, you have to get across the Mekong on a ferry. 15 million people live there. Around a half of the country's rice is produced there. To join that to its markets uh, is, an, is an important, uh, is a key project. It's a joint project, Mr. Speaker. Too, uh, Vietnam is contributing around 28 million dollars to the cost. And Vietnam, of all countries, has no interest in building monuments, as the uh, shadow minister calls them, which are useless. On the question of the timing of the decision, doesn't he know that this decision is the culmination of a well-established timetable, going, which has been going on since 1993, with pre-feasibility and feasibility studies? Well, perhaps he doesn't know that, because the leader of the opposition, when uh, the general secretary of the Communist Party was here in Australia, meeting with people as disreputable as John Prescott and that sort of uh, rabble rouser, yeah, and the Prime Minister. Uh, it, it's hardly surprising Order. that the coalition would have no idea on Vietnamese priorities for the development of their country, and, and absolutely no compunction about putting at risk Australia's relations with a country, with a country which is, in which we are the sixth largest investor, where companies like BHP uh, are, uh, are carrying on uh, important aspects of their business. Well, the member for Mayo also implied that other elements of our aid program would suffer as a result of our commitment to build this bridge, and he's as ignorant on that aspect, Mr. Speaker, as he is of the aid program in general. The fact is that Australia will continue to have a balanced, effective mix of aid activities in Vietnam, in which we'll devote real, continue to devote real attention to health aspects, natural resource development, education, and training. And we'll also continue to fund a non-governmental program, which, at last count, currently involves some 29 separate projects. Even at the height of expenditure on the bridge program, which will be $18.5 million in 1999, the project will account for only about 20 per cent of the expected Australian aid flows to Vietnam. Now, the, the member asked about the implications for exports and jobs. Well, as most members of this House know, perhaps with the exception of the shadow minister, our aid program is all about Australian aid. It's about Australian companies benefiting from infrastructure projects like the Meituan Bridge. It's about Australian farmers who deliver the wheat and the rice, who benefit when we deliver food aid overseas. The, uh, the Shadow Minister's ill-considered statement on the Meituan Bridge will certainly not be welcomed by the wide range of Australian companies who are active throughout Asia in the delivery of Australia's development aid. In fact, those companies have warmly welcomed uh, the, the announcement we made the other day. Let me quote the press release from the MTIA representing manufacturing, engineering and construction industry. Quote, MTIA welcomes today's joint statement by the Prime Minister and the Minister for Development and Cooperation. Tendering for the construction of the Meituan Bridge will be restricted to Australian companies, providing a high-profile opportunity for Australia to demonstrate our world competitive expertise in construction, not just in Vietnam but to other markets in the region. If Australia is to achieve sustained improvements in domestic living standards and job opportunities, uh, it's vital that we increase the level of value-added production particularly of elaborately transformed manufacturers and accelerate growth in value-added e exports." Unquote. Or, Mr Speaker, what about the Australian International Projects Group? Quote, the, the government's decision to partially fund the Meituan Bridge in southern Vietnam is an excellent example, an excellent example of how Australia's aid program can not only advance the economic and social development of an aid recipient country, but serve also to foster industry development in Australia. I can understand why the shadow spokesman talks all through this because it's a bit embarrassing to him. Let's try Australia's no, no, peak, peak engineering body, the Association of Consulting Engineers. 
which accused the Sado spokesman of having, quote, a blinkered vision, unquote. And, and uh, then they went on to say, quote, if the coalition is serious about providing opportunities for one of our most valuable exports, our technological skills, it must commit itself to a sound program of funding and not be content to score political points." Unquote. So the opposition simply doesn't realise that the aid program, as well as delivering essential development assistance to countries in our region, helps in a, in a mighty way to create export markets for Australian goods and to create jobs for Australian companies and Australian workers. And we're doing that in a way which makes most Australians feel very proud of what we're doing overseas. And it's very sad that all one has seen from the opposition on aid is, is negatives. They've certainly not come out with a policy. Nothing since uh, the, before the last election they said that they were going to slash $200 million, $200 million out of our aid budget. Now, that's the last thing they said. Now, that won't help our relations with Vietnam. It won't help our region development. It, it, our region's development. It won't help exports, and it won't help jobs. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Speaker, my question about notice is directed to the Minister for Human Services and Health. I ask the Minister, isn't it a fact that while ever you remain a minister, you are living proof that the Keating government has no standards? But the Herald Sun and the West Australian right with their headlines saying, quote, she lied. Was the editorial of the Herald Sun right when it said, when it said quote, decency would normally dictate that she steps down as a minister of the Crown? If being proved to be a liar is not enough, what would you have to do for you to realise you should stand down now? Finally, Mr Speaker, I ask, isn't it a fact that not only are you prepared to use the family court affairs of an innocent individual for your own political purposes, but, but, but you are now prepared to put yourself over the interests of all your Labor colleagues behind you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister for Human Services and Health. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I think there's, there's no end to the malice to come from the opposite side. No end to it, Mr. Speaker. And what I was, what order, I was pointing order. out earlier was that the Commission itself is flawed and was flawed right from the outset. I mean, if you want to talk about family court matters being raised, why did the terms of reference of the Commission not include how that was first done and who did it and under what circumstances? because the answers to those questions would seriously have embarrassed the present exactly. Premier. The terms of reference didn't allow any examination either, Mr Speaker, of whether or not Mr Court had made statements inside and outside the Parliament that were inconsistent with what he said before the Royal Commission. That matter was not addressed at all by the Royal Commission, Mr Speaker. Just in relation to that headline, it may have given members opposite a, a few moments of entertainment to hold it up like that, but I think what it shows is that in, in Western Australia, Mr. Speaker, in Western Australia, despite, Order. despite Order. six months of effort, the expenditure of taxpayers for Liberal Party propaganda, taxpayers' funds for Liberal Party propaganda, a very hem heavy emphasis by the West Australian, Member that the people McKellar. of Western Australia are very cynical indeed about two things. Firstly, the motivation and findings of that report. A great many people simply don't accept them. And, Mr Speaker, when they hear condemnation of me Member for Sturdy, coming from the yourself? mouths if you of are, the Leader don't. of the Opposition and the likes of the Member for Stirling and others who are part of the party of hate, the government and the opposition of hate, they are very cynical indeed, Mr Speaker. They are very cynical indeed. And they ask from what standpoint the Leader of the Opposition, who wouldn't even be clear about what sort of discussions, if any, he'd had with Premier Court about this matter, can possibly have. How can, Mr Speaker, somebody who, before the last Order. election, when he had an opportunity to inform the people about the state of the economy as a government minister, chose to mislead them very directly and deliberately, Mr Speaker? How can we, Mr Speaker, as a community, how can Order. the voters in Order. Western Australia how can anybody listen to you talk about standards? It simply doesn't wash, Mr Speaker. It simply doesn't wash. You may choose to condemn me. Order. You may choose to condemn me. Some editorials may condemn me. I can stand up and say that I have behaved always in ways that are consistent with my office. And I won't hear. And Mr Speaker, Order. when I hear Order. criticism from members opposite, I ask two things. What is the nature of the criticism and what is the advantage, what is the advantage to the opposition 
in continuing this campaign. Mr. Speaker, I think whatever advantage they may Order. have gained, and I would concede that there is some, is fast running out because now they are being seen as malicious, vindictive, and unprincipled. The Honourable Member for Kalea. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Human Services and Health and relates to a serious matter involving her ministerial portfolio. And I ask what measures, what measures is the government taking to increase the supply of specialist medical officers in rural areas? The Honourable the Minister for Human Services and Health. I thank the member for Kalea for this question because I know that he too has been working hard to ensure that there are more doc doctors practising in his rural electorate and others around the country. There is clearly an undersupply of specialists in rural areas, and we've been addressing this problem. Despite the opposition's interest in other matters, member we've actually Marinella, been getting on with the job. Colleague, the member for Parks is endeavouring to hear the response. Mr. He Speaker, has a great interest in this. As many members will know, since they represent country electorates, particularly on our side of the House, a lot of Australians have to travel long distances before they can get access to specialist services, and that places a lot of stress on local GPs who have to manage some very difficult cases in the absence of specialist backup. So we've implemented a number of initiatives, Mr Speaker, to assist, including some $2.1 million, which I announced today, to boost specialist services. We have a major GP program, but this will assist in the provision of specialist services. Indeed, 14 new training specialist posts around Australia. And simply, the thinking behind it is that if you train people in the country and they become accustomed to the lifestyle, they're more likely to return there and to practice. And I'm pleased particularly to inform the member for Kallir that $140,000 has been provided to the Central West Health Service in Orange for an obstetrics and gynaecology training position, something that's much needed. Through this initiative, Mr Speaker, the 14 training posts, uh, there will be positions in one of a number of specialties, ophthalmology, surgery, internal medicine and radiation oncology, and they'll be established in Townsville, Cairns, Kalgoorlie, Bunbury, Swan Hill, Wagga Wagga and Alice Springs. And in addition, Mr. Speaker, there are psychiatric training posts to be established in Broken Hill, Alice Springs and Mount Isa, because we know that there has been poor access to psychiatric services and part of the national mental health strategy is to improve that. Through the means that I've just announced, Mr. Speaker, there'll be some 40 additional specialists to enter the workforce over the next four years who will have had unique training in country areas. And part of that training will be to provide outreach services to Aboriginal communities who live in the remote parts of Australia. So I'm sure that Members understand we can't compel practitioners to work in the country, but we can certainly assist them to have a better knowledge of it and to provide their services through this means. The Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. I ask that further questions be placed on the page. The... Sure, the Honourable yeah. Member for Boothby. Mr Speaker, I refer to the hiring next week of the Great Hall to the Mooney organisation called the Family Federation for Unification and World Peace Australia, registered as an Australian company early this month. I don't wish to go into the controversies that surround this organisation other than to point out that there is sufficient literature in the parliamentary library to describe its origins and philosophies and its business and political activities. My question to you, sir, is who is responsible for hiring out the Great Hall? Is some assessment made of the bona fides of applicants? If not, is it available to all and any fringe groups that might apply? Would the legal rights be acceptable? Uh, in respect to the, the general issue that the honourable member has raised, I can say that uh, an organisation misrepresented itself to both the president and myself and officers of this, uh, this parliament in respect of uh, wanting to hire out the Great Hall for a function. Um, when that misrepresentation was discovered, the original granting of approval was withdrawn and uh, it is clearly outside what has been established over a long period of time as acceptable guidelines. With respect to those detailed four questions I think that you put to me, I'll be happy to get a response and get back to the honourable member.